Welcome back to our second day of plenary session. I'm glad to invite Professor Dina Katabi of MIT. She will talk on working at the intersection of machine learning, signal processing, sensors, and circuits. Let me briefly introduce Professor Dina Katabi. Dina Katabi is an Andrew and Elena Bitabi Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT, a Mac Author Fellowship, and a member of National Academy of Engineering. She is a leader of the NAT network at MIT Research Group, a part of Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, and a director of the MIT Center for Wireless Networks and mobile computing. Professor Katabi received her PhD and MS degrees from MIT in 2003 and 1999, and her Bachelor of Science from Damascus University in 1995. Her research interests span mobile systems, health, IoT, and wireless networks. She develops new technologies algorithms and systems that provide non-invasive health monitoring, enabling smart homes, improve Wi-Fi and cellular performance, and deliver new applications that are not feasible given today's technologies. She has received multiple prestigious awards, including the ACM Prize in Computing, the ACM Grace Mali Hopper Award, two SIGCOM Test of Time Awards, a Solang Fellowship, the IEEE William R. Bennett Prize, and multiple Best Paper Awards. Several startups have been spun out of Katabi's lab, such as Pi Charging and Emerald. Please join me welcoming Professor Dina Katabi. Hello everyone, my name is Dina Kitabi and I am professor at MIT. In this presentation, I will tell you a bit about my research, which, uh, which spans uh, wireless sensing, machine learning, signal processing, and circuits. So I work on radio systems, and radio systems are very interesting because they touch many aspects of our modern life including communication, things like GPS, smart homes, smart transportation networks, even medical implants. Nowadays, many of them, they have wireless transceivers in them. And this area is uh, also very interdisciplinary by nature. If you work with radio systems, I mean, you have to understand something about electromagnetic waves. You have to understand something about circuits because this is how we transmit radio signals and how we receive them. And much of what we do is related to signal, pro uh, signal processing and communication theory. I myself, I am a computer scientist and I'm particularly interested also about uh, uh, with uh, wireless systems that are, are part of IoT or the Internet of Things and cloud computing. And most recently, I find it very fascinating to work on how we can interpret radio signals using neural networks and how neural networks can extract new information from the signal and also guide us in how to design our system. So being interdisciplinary is very intrinsic to radio systems, but also is very important for the future of the area as we see more of integration between software and hardware and we see more new domains that we can reach to using these like integration of neural networks uh, and bridging double E and CS. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to present to you three different systems uh, that have interdis interdisciplinary concepts in them. I'm gonna start with uh, neural networks for designing circuits and then I'm gonna talk about something that we call embodied GPS. And finally, I'm going to tell you about my most recent work on this concept that we call the invisibles. So let's start with uh, neural networks for circuit design. 
you guys in circuit, in most of the cases, you talk about how you can design circuits for neural networks. Uh, so how we can have circuits that are more suitable for uh, the computation in neural networks, for the uh, for power consumptions of neural networks, etc. But you can flip this question and you can ask, how can you use a neural networks to design circuits? And I'm going to show you a simple example uh, where we use this concept to design circuit. I'm going to focus on distributed circuit design, and I'm going to, to look at very high frequencies, such as hundreds of gigahertz or terahertz. And this area is very interesting because designing circuits at such high frequency is very hard. And you cannot just use the standard method from textbook that tells you about how to design your filters and your antennas and all of that stuff. So it becomes uh, an art designing such uh, high frequencies to ship this circuit. So let's say that you have some specification like a filter and you really need an expert on high frequency or terahertz design. And that expert is going to come up with some circuit, initial circuit, is going to use an EM simulator to simulate the uh, response function of that circuit. And then he's gonna keep iterating on that simulation and design and tuning the circuit. And every time he iterates, hopefully the response function improves and eventually he will get something that is close enough to the desired functionality. Now, this process, unfortunately, is tedious and takes a long time, can take weeks to even months from such an expert. So what happens if we actually replace the EM simulator and the expert with a neural network? So we want this neural network to be an EM simulator. So we're going to train it and make it used for simulating new neural network, a new circuit design that it hasn't seen before. And then actually, we are gonna also use it to optimize the design and iterate on it so that it can give us better specifications or better design that's, that matches the specifications. And with this approach, we were able to reduce the time that is used for EM simulation from minutes to milliseconds and reduce the time that is taken for designing such distributed circuits from weeks or months to minutes. So how does it work? Now, at a high level, it's not that simple to actually use a neural network to design circuits. And one of the problems in that is that if you take an expert, if you take a human, actually the human is using these building blocks and it's, it has a variety of of options and he's using his own understanding to design circuit with different topologies with different uh, representation of these building blocks while neural networks typically are not as um, capable because typically you design a neural network to take certain input and produce certain outputs certain formatting for the input and the output so to allow, allow a neural network to be able to come up with much larger space of circuit design and very different topologies, we need to have a, a structure of neural network that allow us to deal with a variety of topology and size of circuit and a uh, combination of things. And for that, we use a graph in neural networks. So let me explain how it works. So in most areas of circuit design, you have certain building blocks for your circuit. In this case, these building blocks are resonators. And you want to connect these building blocks in a way that achieve a particular goal. When you connect these building blocks together, they interact with each other. And in this case, they interact via electromagnetic coupling. So what we are going to do is to think about our building blocks, our resonators as nodes in a graph and the way they interact with each other via uh, electromagnetic coupling as edges in this graph. And then we are going to characterize these nodes with specific information about these building blocks. So in our case, the size of the resonator, the width, the, the shape, if it has a slit, where the slit is, is what is the orientation, etc. 
And also we are going to characterize the interaction between these building blocks. Again, if we are talking about electromagnetic coupling, then we are going to characterize it through the distance to an orientation of these uh, building blocks with respect to each other. And now we have this graph neural network, and I'm not going to get to the details of how you train these graph neural networks, but you can train these, uh, this style of neural networks. And once you train it, you actually can use it to design a new circuit and new circuits that have also completely different topology for their resonators. So let's say, for example, you start from a random guess and you have certain specification for your circuit, then you can compare the output of the, the neural network, which now acts as a simulator, and you can compare it to your specification with some loss function, and then use uh, the fact that a neural network is differentiable, so you can apply back propagation of the gradient to optimize the design. And you can keep iterating on this until you reach a design that satisfy your specs. And of course, there is a lot of details to this idea, but let's see whether it works. So we collaborated on this project with a group at MIT that works on terahertz design. And one of the tasks was uh, we, the, the group has a PhD student, a senior PhD student, who was asked to design a channelizer at very high frequency between 200 to 300 gigahertz. And uh, I'm going to show you, so th this is uh, the response as to one of the, uh, the channelizer. Uh, and I'm going to show you the design that the student was able to come, uh, come up with, and it's uh, S21. And I'm going to show you also the design that the neural network came up with. So here are the two designs. So the student expert, the PhD students, took two months to come up with this design. And it is a good design, but the neural network took five minutes and came up with similar design. So that's... Um, a very useful thing to allow for designing these circuits at uh, way less effort from the expert. Now, of course, in EM simulator, you have also software packages that can help in designing and optimizing systems. So we wanted to compare such software packages uh, with our neural network. So we, we are using CST Studio and uh, we are focus on the design of a uniband filter, again, at very high frequency between 200 to 300 gigahertz. And we use CST and we use a neural network. And let's see the results. So first, uh, let's look at the pass band. And here on the x-axis, we, we measure how similar the pass band to the desired pass band. And of course, higher is better. And in red, you can see the neural network. And in blue, you can see CST, and this is a CDF, a cumulative distributed, uh, distributed function. And as you can see, the neural network is able to get much closer to uh, the passband that is desired. You can look also at the, the insertion loss of the circuit, and you can see here lower is better, and again, the red line is better than the blue line, so the neural network is is more capable at optimizing the, ins the insertion loss. So this example shows you a simple example for using neural networks in, in circuit design. And we looked here at distributed circuit design, but the component and the line of thinking is similar in a variety of circuit problems because you always have some building blocks that you are connecting them and you are making them interact with each other toward achieving, uh, to achieve a particular circuit with certain specifications. So next, I'm going to talk about this uh, embodied GPS. So over the past few years, medicine has changed dramatically, and now we are uh, we have so many different uh, types of electronics and devices that actually are used inside the body. Just to give you an example, I'm sure all of you guys have heard about capsule endoscopy, where you can take a capsule and uh, you can uh, have the patient swallow that capsule, and the capsule will just go through the GI tract 
and you can uh, the capsule will take images of different parts of the GI tract and uh, broadcast these images using wireless signals to the outside to the doctor so that he can track uh, and uh, see how the GI tracts and the health of the GI tracts in different area. So here what you are talking about is a form of in-body communication over wireless signals and also localization you would like ideally to be able to tell where exactly this capsule at any point in time so that you know which part of the, of the GI tract this image is coming from. But this problem is not limited, of course, to uh, a capsule endoscopy. Uh, there are many similar uh, scenario where you need communication and localization inside the body. For example, uh, in proton therapy, you need to beam signal on cancer. And it's very helpful if you can have these small uh, electronics that can be used to, to track the location of the cancer because as the person breathes, for example, and because also of bowel movement, the cancer can move and then the radiation can hit the healthy tissues. And, and similarly, you have these uh, micro robots that go inside the body and deposit drugs in specific location and specific organs, and you would like to guide them and track their location inside the body. So how can we get communication and local, localization inside the body? Now, for people who work on wireless systems, of course, there are so many ways you can use wireless systems to, to do communication and localization. I mean, we know how to communicate, of course, using Wi-Fi, LTE, Bluetooth, Zigbee, you name it. But not only this, we know actually how to localize a transceiver based on the wireless signal. So can we use these systems to uh, achieve communication and localization inside the body? Unfortunately, this doesn't work because all of these systems require humongous amount of power to transmit these signals. So the question becomes, can we get localization and uh, communication from inside the body, but Ideally, we want it to be happening without any power consumption, a zero power consumption. And in fact, we do have a system that can achieve localization and communication at zero power consumption. And this is something called backscatter. So for people who don't know what backscatter is, let me explain uh, with uh, a simple illustration. So you transmit a signal and then uh, it reaches the capsule. And let's say the capsule wants to apply backscatter. So the capsule modulates the signal and reflects it back. And the modulation can be happening using something very simple, like just switch back uh, on and off. And the, the, the backscatter power comes from the RF signal itself to, ch uh, to charge this capsule for doing the communication. So, Using this backscatter, as I said, we can communicate and using the signal coming from the capsule through backscatter, the transceiver can localize this capsule. Now, all of this is easy if the capsule is outside the body. But once the capsule is inside the body, then you have a different problem. So it becomes, the question becomes, can we do backscatter in deep tissues? And I'm not talking about uh, just like something like an RFID under the skin. I'm talking about really in deep tissue. Like if you have a capsule in the GI tract, then you have to go through multiple centimeters, five, six centimeters of the body before you can reach that capsule. And that actually is challenging. So the problem is that you, when you transmit such wireless signal, much of the wireless signal actually is going to reflect from the skin. And only a very minute part of that wireless signal is going to go inside the body. And then when inside the body, the wireless signal attenuates exponentially. Imagine exponential attenuation. And so that signal gets even smaller and then you do the backscatter and then again, the signal has to propagate inside the body with exponential attenuation, and then eventually it gets to the air and gets to the receiver. But the problem is that you have a humongous, humongous dynamic range 
here between the, the signal that reflected off the skin and this minute backscatter that went through the body back and forth. And the, the, the dynamic range is on the order of hundreds of, mil, uh, hundred of millions of times difference between the skin level signal and the backscatter signal. So there is no way that your transceiver is going to be able to sense this minute signal from inside the deep tissues in the body. So what can we do? So here is a solution. We are going to use nonlinearities in circuits. Now, when you talk to someone who, who does, who works on radio systems, like nonlinearities is something that is bad. Like you really don't want nonlinearities. You ideally, we want our system to be as linear as possible. However, in this case, we are going to use nonlinearities to our advantage. So let me show you how we do this. So we are going to transmit two radio signals with different frequencies, F1 and F2. They are going to reflect off the skin, but some of this signal will go inside the body. Now, if this capsule has nonlinearity in it, then it's going to distort the signal, distort that sinusoid, and that distortion is going to create a variety of harmonics. So you, now you get frequency or signals at frequency F1 plus F2 to F1 to F2 to F1 plus F2, etc. And this is actually good because these signals, they actually do not fall in the same frequency as the skin signal. So what you get now is the skin reflections, which happen at F1 and F2, like the original signals, but you get the backscatter target reflections, which happens at these harmonics. So you can put a band pass filter to get the signal of interest, eliminate the signal from the skin, and you don't have a dynamic range problem. And now you can receive. Now, well, another thing that is really nice is that you can use this nonlinearity and apply it using something very simple, like a Schottky diode. So Schottky diode is very small and it is passive, so you are not consuming any power. And now you have an in-body GPS that you can use both to communicate and to localize uh, using backscatter. So we built this uh, circuit and we used it uh, to, to do in-body communication and localization. So let me show you some results. So of course, we didn't try to uh, inject it inside a living human body or even living animal. What we used is the closest that we can get to that, which is our human tissue phantoms. So these phantoms are designed specifically to emulate the human tissues. And also we can use animal tissues from dead animals. So let me show you the results. So first I'm going to show you the communication. So on the X axis, we have the depths, like how, how deep inside the body this uh, backscatter uh, circuit is. And on the Y axis, I'm showing you the SNR received by the transceiver outside the body. And here are the results for the human phantom. And here are the results for the chicken. And as you can see, in both cases, we are getting very reasonable SNR, and we are getting that at depths that are quite deep inside the body, like six centimeter, seven centimeter. And the SNR range is between five to 15 dB inside the body. So this means that we can get data rates that are at least one megabit per second, which is quite decent for communicating and sending information from inside the body. Now let's look at localization. So on the x-axis, I'm showing you the localization error. On, on the y-axis, I'm showing you a cumulative distribution function or CDF. And here are the results. And as you can see, our localization is very good. In fact, the localization errors are on the order of one or two centimeters, which is very good. Like you can tell, for example, where this uh, capsule is. Is it like in the stomach? Is it in the intestine? Uh, and as it moves around, you can localize it. In the last part, in the last part of this talk, I'm going to tell you about how we move from the wearables to the invisibles. 
So over the last few years, I've been uh, focusing on how we can improve healthcare and particularly how we can bring the care to the home. And with the COVID pandemic, it is pretty clear that we need to take care of COVID patients in their own homes. But even this is before COVID, I mean, the cost of healthcare is uh, very, very high, and it is particularly caused by chronic disease patients. And chronic disease patients are exacerbation in chronic diseases, such as heart diseases or pulmonary diseases. They don't happen overnight. They actually accumulate gradually. And if you can monitor the, the, the patients at home, you can detect these accumulations early on and hopefully help the patient before they end up in the hospital or in the uh, emergency room. But if you want to bring the care to the home, then you have to be able to measure physiological signals in the home and measure them accurately. Unfortunately, today, if we are trying to measure uh, physiological signals, I mean, we don't really have very good ways to do that. So for example, if you want to measure, let's say breathing, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna ask your patient to wear a nasal poop, like the guy here? If you want to uh, measure movements for diseases like Parkinson's, for example, you have these accelerometers that you can put on the limbs of your patients to measure their gaits. Uh, for falls, we have a pendant and the patient has to push a button. And then if you wanna monitor sleep, then you have to, and if you wanna get it accurately to get sleep stages, you have to put these electrodes on the, on the head and the body of the patient and ask them to sleep like the woman in the slide. Now, of course, this is not a happy picture and it's very hard to continuously monitor people using these methods. But what if somebody comes and tells you that we can monitor all of these things for you and many more without any sensor on the person's body? Patients can just go on about their life naturally and we can passively obtain all of these measurements. So this is exactly what we have been doing in my group at MIT. We invented a device that looks very much like a Wi-Fi router at home. We call it the Emerald Box. But what is special about this device is that it uses the neural networks to analyze the electromagnetic waves in the environment. And from that, it can get the respiration signal, your heartbeat, sleep, sleep stages, sleep apnea, gait, mobility, and many other metrics completely passively and without any sensors on the person's body. So to illustrate this concept, let's look at this video. Now, we all know that wireless signals spread inside the home. They reflect off the human body because our bodies are full of water. And some of these reflections come back to our device, which analyzes them using machine learning. And in this case, it will uh, alert the care, detect a full alert the caregiver via text, email, or phone call. Now, I want to show you a few examples from the lab. Uh, so this is one of the offices at MIT. This is an early version of our device. And in this experiment, we wanted to monitor the movement of this person, but we wanted to monitor him from the adjacent office. So the device is in the adjacent office behind this wall. Now, this red uh, dot here that you see is where the device thing this person is standing right now. Now I'm gonna play this video for you and as the person moves, you're gonna see how the device will be able to track him using uh, purely the how his body changes the electromagnetic waves. Now, as he moves, you can see that the red dot is tracking him. And uh, this is purely from uh, how his body changes the electromagnetic waves around him. And we are doing that tracking from a different room through a wall. Now, if you look at the red dot, you can see that it is tracking him pretty accurately. Now, being able to track the movement of a person is very important for a variety of diseases, such as Parkinson's, um, uh, multiple scler sclerosis, ataxia, Huntington, uh, and many other mo uh, motion disorders. And uh, in fact, when you, when you approve drugs for these kinds of diseases, people use something called the six minute walking test. And uh, you can emulate this test continuously in the home by being able to get how people walk like this. 
And in fact, like in all our measurements, what we do is we, we compare the accuracy of our tracking with uh, the motion, uh, the vehicle motion tracking uh, system, which is very accurate system that can, uh, can get you sub millimeter accuracy in location. And our system provide 98% accuracy in comparison to vehicle motion capture. Now, this is one of our earlier results. However, if you look at this uh, figure, you see this red dot here, and you know where the person is, but you don't know whether he's standing or sitting. And also when he was moving, you saw the red dot sliding, but you couldn't tell whether he was moving with his uh, right foot or left foot. So I want to show you more recent results uh, from a much more advanced system that we have today. So here what you see is the um, bigger frame is actually what the, what the wireless device sees. And now you see that the wireless device is able to extract full skeletons of the human body. If what you see on the side, this is the camera inside the room. And this is just so that you can compare what the wireless device sees with the, act the action and what is going on inside the room. So let me play this video for you. So now you see like when he sits, the wireless device detects that he's sitting. And when he walks, you can see whether he's walking with left foot or right foot and so on. And all of this we can achieve with advanced neural network that analyzes the wireless signal in the environment without any extra information about the body. We can also get other things like sleep stages. So when, the, when we go to sleep, our brain waves change and we enter different stages, awake, light sleep, deep sleep, and rapid eye movements. These, these stages are important for sleep disorders, but they are also important for a variety of diseases. For example, rapid eye movement is a stage in which we dream. And it is very much related to our emotional uh, health and uh, for example, when people have depression, one of the things that happen is that the stage rapid eye movement starts happening too early during sleep. Uh, deep sleep is related to consolidating our memory. Uh, so uh, one of the things uh, that uh, recent articles have, have shown is that there is a correlation between uh, the slow waves during deep sleep and Alzheimer's disease. So how, how can we monitor these uh, sleep stages? Today, if you want to monitor sleep stages, you have to send your patient to the sleep lab and they put all of these sensors and electrodes on his head and body, and they ask him to sleep like this. Now, of course, it's very hard to sleep with all of these sensors on one's body and also to sleep uh, not on his bed in a different place, and this is, very difficult to do. And if even if you do it once or twice, it's not going to allow you to have very longitudinal uh, study where you can monitor sleep every night. So let me show you how we monitor sleep stages. So this is our device. It transmits very low power wireless signal, much lower power than Wi-Fi, and analyzes the reflection using neural network and spits out the sleep stages throughout the night. As you can see here, he's sleeping in his own body, uh, in, in his own band, without any sensors on his body. And uh, we did a study with Mass General Hospital in which we uh, looked at sleep stages from 25 subjects for 100 nights. And the accuracy that we have, the accuracy of the system is 80%. Now, of course, for, for you to be able to assess whether 80% is good or low, or like I, ha I have to tell you a bit more about sleep stages and how, how, we, uh, how sleep stages are generated today. So today, if you want to have sleep staging, you send a patient, as we said, to the sleep lab, and they put all of these electrodes on his head and body. And in the morning, there is a sleep technician who comes and look at that signal 
And for every 30 seconds, the sleep technician decides, okay, light sleep, deep sleep, uh, REM, et cetera. But if you take the same sleep signal from the same person on the same night and give it to a different sleep technician, then he's going to make, to some extent, a different decision. And the consistency between two sleep technicians on average over the same night and the same data from the same person on average is 83%. So being able to get sleep staging for every 30 seconds uh, with an accuracy that is 80% is pretty close to the sleep lab. So we can also monitor breathing. So this guy here is sitting like you guys now, and what you see on the screen is his inhales and exhale. And we ask him to hold his breath, and then you can see the signal stays, stays steady because he exhaled and he did not inhale. Now, of course, like in all of our measurements, we compare with the gold standard. And in this case, we compare with FDA approved uh, breathing belt uh, that you put on the person. And the accuracy is on average 97%. Now, I want to zoom in on this signal further. So this is the same uh, uh, breathing signal. What you see are the inhales and exhales. But on the signal, you see these small blibs on the signal. This is actually not noise. These are his heartbeats. So our wireless device is very sensitive, is able to get the pulsing of the blood from this person without touching him from a distance. <coughs> Over the last two years, we have been working with doctors in a variety of diseases such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, FSHD, Crohn's disease, uh, atopic dermatitis, COPD. And we deployed our uh, devices in the home of patients in all of these diseases and a few more. And we have been helping the doctors to understand disease, developing digital biomarkers for these diseases and having a better understanding of the disease itself and how the patients deal with it. But in this uh, presentation, I want to tell you particularly about results from monitoring uh, our COVID patients. So uh, before doing that, let me show you, this is our device. And as you can see, the device is just very much uh, slightly like bigger than your uh, a wireless box uh, or a uh, Wi-Fi access point. And it sits on the wall and it's monitor everything completely passively while the patient go, goes on about his or her own life. <coughs> and uh, I wanna tell you a bit more about the results of monitoring COVID patients with this Emerald device. So if you think about COVID, when somebody tests COVID positive, what happens in most cases, they are asked to go home and self-isolate at home and if their symptoms get worse, to seek medical help. But one of the problem is that patients are very bad at assessing the severity of their symptoms. So in many cases, the symptoms starts getting worse, but the patient may not notice like that they are getting worse until actually they get uh, severe uh, symptoms like uh, respiration, depression, and then they have to be rushed to the hospital put on oxygen and potentially even put on ventilators. So what we wanted to do is to monitor the recovery of these COVID-19 patients as they are self-isolating at home and see whether we can track what identify good recovery paths from bad recovery paths and so that we can, we, uh, we can detect good recovery and start identifying when there are recovery problems. <clears throat> so let's first look at the patient who is recovering well. So here what you see is uh, the, her respiration signal. And uh, on April 7, after she came back from the hospital, her respiration has very high breathing rate, 23 breaths per minute. Four days later, on April 11, the respiration is um, closer to normal, and actually the respiration rate now is 18 breaths per minute, and it's actually much closer to her baseline. 
Now, having a, an elevated respiration rate uh, when you have COVID is, uh, is, a com is a common thing. And having that respiration going back to normal is actually a good sign of recovery. Another good sign of recovery is uh, having better mobility. So let me explain this, uh, this slide. So this green box here is the device, is our wireless box. And this green dot is the patient. And you can see the layout of their space. And this is their bedroom. And this is uh, the chair, the bathroom. And we are going to see how the patient's motion and compare between the motion on April 8th and four days later on April 11th. So let me play this for you. Three days later on April 11th. So as you can see, the, the patient moves much faster on April 11 than on April 8. So in both cases, the patient moving them from the chair to the bathroom, but she's much faster and uh, also much more balanced in her motion. So this is a good sign of recovery because we all know that also COVID comes with fatigue and inability to move. And as the patient starts moving and gaining her natural gait, that in indicates that she's moving smoothly toward the recovery. But unfortunately, not, like uh, not all recoveries uh, are smooth and some patients have problems. So let me show you one uh, aspect of bad breathing that we see in some of the COVID patients. So in some of the patients, we see very abnormal breathing. And so here what you see is a breathing signal from one of those patients. And as you can see, the respiration signal, instead of the nice up and down, the sinusoidal curve that you see with healthy individual, here you see that the breathing signal is uh, very irregular, both in terms of the amplitude of the signal, as well as the frequency, like you see some of these uh, uh, gaps are wide and some of them are narrow. So he, he breathes slowly and faster and slowly and faster. So, uh, so this is a form of abnormal breathing. In fact, our study shows that respiration is very important signal in the recovery of a COVID patient. And uh, patients themselves are it's hard for a patient to see and to feel that their respiration is changing because like basically if my respiration is two breaths per minute faster, I'm not going to be able to tell. But if you have an objective way of measuring continuously the respiration signal of patient, then you can distinguish whether that respiration is improving or there is some problem. So let me show you, for example, a patient who had problems in her respiration and she had to be moved to the hospital. So let me explain this graph. So each one of these blue curves is a histogram of the respiration rate on one particular day. So the first one, for example, is on April 8th. And uh, what you see here is a histogram and you see that the mode of this histogram is around 18 breaths per minute. So the patient was recovering and in fact, her respiration rate was decreasing until there is, uh, uh, she reached uh, April 14 and suddenly the respiration rate goes much higher. And indeed the patient was not feeling well on that day and she ended up in the hospital. She stayed in the hospital for one week. And then you see after she came back from the hospital here on April 21st, her respiration now is again improving and gradually the respiration rate is decreasing and eventually the patient recovered and uh, became COVID negative. So when you, when you look at COVID patients and you consider their respiration signal, you can distinguish between three types of patients, uh, which are the type of patients that we keep hearing about. Uh, so patients who actually have problems in recovering so these are similar to the one that I showed you. And in the worst case, they end up in the hospital again. And patient whose recovery might be difficult, but actually is smooth. So they keep, the respiration keeps improving until eventually they, they become COVID negative. And then there are patients who are asymptomatic. So you see that the respiration doesn't show any sign of abnormality. And eventually, I mean, the patient doesn't have any symptoms and eventually they become COVID negative, but they have no symptoms. 
So uh, what this shows us is that there is this um, underused uh, biomarker for COVID, and that would allow us to, to assess the recovery status of the patient passively and objectively and detect problems hopefully before they end up being uh, causing the patient to reach to the uh, hospital. And with this, I reached the end of my talk. And I told you about this new technology that we call the invisibles, and that would allow us to monitor the health of patients without asking them to wear wearables on their body or to report anything is completely passive. They can just live their normal life. And uh, before Indy, I want to add two things. One thing is that, of course, as uh, like when collecting health data and dealing with patients, it's very important to focus on privacy. It's very important that uh, any studies that we do with uh, human subjects, of course, we get the approval of our IOB, our institutional IOB, and it is uh, based on informed consent, each patient and each person that is uh, part of our study has to sign an, a, uh, a consent form. And the data that is collected is uh, basically, we think of it that the patient or the person owns their data, and it is for them to decide who can get access to that data. And all data is encrypted and uh, separated completely from any personal identifiers. Now, before finishing, I, I want to uh, highlight this uh, this important uh, situation with the healthcare system, where we know that the cost of healthcare is very high. We know that we are facing situation like with COVID, things are getting worse and we have health crisis. But even without COVID, with the aging population, we have to be able to attend to patients and attend to them in their normal environment, particularly for chronic uh, disease patients and for older patients. And uh, one way I believe that we can do this is with, kind of the, with this kind of invisible technology that allows patients to live their life and be able to detect whether there are problems in their health and be able to alert the doctor early on and uh, alert the caregiver and have them intervene, intervene before the patient end up in the hospital or the, in the emergency room. And with this, I reached the end of my talk. Thank you.